the company. And she started as a part-time night shift box handler and worked her way up to president of Latin America and Caribbean operations. So we're very proud of you, Secretary Carranza. Uh, Secretary Carranza earned her MBA from the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida, and received executive governance, management, and financial training at the INSEAD Business School in Paris, France, Michigan State University, and the University of Chicago. So thank you very much, Secretary Carranza, for being with us today. Uh, I'd like to open um, just giving you the floor. I know you have many things to share with us. We have some specific questions to ask you, but I'd like to begin just by uh, giving you a welcome and thanking you for being with us today. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say that for the sake of time, I'll make this very brief introduction, but I wanted to thank you, Monica and Dr. Metzler, for putting together this call because all day and all week and weeks, actually, I've been um, uh, available to speak to a lot of the like as you stated, Monica, that have many, many questions. And uh, the fact that you ramped up this call in such short order speaks volumes of the importance for us to get this right and uh, the concern that's out there uh, within the, the 30 million small businesses, which you reflect a very large part of them. Uh, you know, earlier in the year, we, we focused in on the trajectory that small businesses we're realizing an entrepreneur's, entrepreneurship uh, strengthening uh, in our economy. And now we're faced with a situation where it you know, has brought um, great hardships to our families and our employees, our coworkers, our communities, and our nation. So I, I want to share with all of you that our hearts, everyone at SBA who's very committed and whose whole mission uh, is to serve the small business, feels for everyone who has had to um, experience um, such hardships, both medically, financially, and then personally in some way. Um, as everyone knows, the number one priority is the health and safety of the American people. And so that is of utmost importance to uh, the federal government because we serve the needs of the people. And uh, we're doing as much as we possibly can to keep everyone healthy, to follow all of the CDC rules, which I'm sure you hear every hour on the hour um, throughout the day. But I, I'd be remiss if I wouldn't reinforce the importance of our uh, family members of practicing uh, those um, uh, CDC recommendations. But let me point out that as, a, as the SBA administrator, my sole purpose for being here is to help uh, and support as many small businesses as possible, and that in its current state to minimize your economic disruption. And that's why, again, this call is so important today. And um, I never thought that an SBA administrator as many times as I've advocated, excuse me, um, and have spoken on speeches that we're here to serve our 30 million small businesses, and now the proof is in the pudding. We have 30 million small businesses that definitely um, have a need for financial stability, for financial reinforcement, and we're here um, hopefully to uh, disseminate those funds as quickly as possible. Our team across the country, our disaster assistance staff, which you'll hear from uh, in a minute, and our district offices and the many resource partners that we have, and you know them as SBDCs, as um, the Women's Business Centers, and as SCORE members. They're hard at work every single day, whether they're in their office or in their homes teleworking. They are available by phone, by email, as well as hosting, as we speak now, numerous webinars. Um, they're constantly training and developing outreach strategies in your particular areas. So we are dedicated to the mission of assisting on our, our entrepreneurs in every corner of the nation. I am, um, and wherever we don't have a visual um, touch point, we're going to have an audio touch point, much like we're doing today. And again, I can't um, help to um, reemphasize the 
Dr. Metzler and Monica for, for making this, this session possible today. Thank you, let Administrator. Me, yes, yes, let me just point out that SBA is working. Uh, I'm going to touch on a few things that we have been able to put in place uh, based on my authority. Uh, it's not something that we have to wait for legislation. That's already occurred um, in the past that we are now uh, exercising in full authority here at SBA, and that's to expedite the process for small businesses applying for, as you know it, the EIDL loan, which is the Economic Injury Disaster Loans. And so um, as a result of that and, the, and, and um, the support of our Office of Disaster, currently, once the state declaration has been issued, and I just signed, what was it, Steve, about six of them right now, yep. um, that's bringing it up to 40 states, I believe, that now have declared their entire state as a disaster uh, for, for disaster assistance. At one point, we used to have a process where governors had to state the counties and they would have to identify a small business in those counties. So now I have, at a stroke of a pen, if the governor has um, submitted an application, we identify five small businesses that have experienced hardship in that state and we now have designated the entire state. Uh, for disaster assistance, and so we've cut through a lot of red tape in that area, and that this is a, a an immediate change and an unprecedented policy that uh, required a lot of um, steps in the process, and we've just cut through all that red tape. Now, what I want to reinforce, Monica, to to the audience here, that currently the program is if you access uh, the disaster loan application online. Um, there is a section that if the small business um, does not qualify that particular loan, um, there's a decline box. And what we're doing to expedite the process for those that don't qualify at the first pass, the first attempt of applying, we are taking that list of uh, declines. It could be anywhere from 100 to 200 to 300 a day. And we're immediately turning them around and giving them to the district offices and our resource partners. And within 24 hours to 48 hours, they will be contacted by our offices and counsel on how they can reapply and realize uh, some of the additional resources uh, available there. So uh, I don't want any of the small businesses that are uh, available on your call or those that you're going to speak to after this that uh, would be denied it, uh, instantaneously. Uh, we we do have um, counseling and some reworks to be able to qualify them for the benefits. And so as the governors are finalizing the states and territories request, we are encouraging these offices, the governor's offices, to work closely with the SBA to ensure that all of the requirements are included. So we're even working with the governor's staff to ensure that their application, that is to say, for declaration, a uh, disaster declaration, is expedited as well. That is additionally, I have, yes, Monica, I, additionally, I have, um, I have the head of my Office of Entrepreneurial Development, Ellen Gutierrez, here, and a representative from our Capital Access Program. Uh, I, I will cover some of the details on our flagship Loan, uh, loan portfolio, which you know is 7A and Community Express, et cetera. And, he, and they're here to address any questions as well. So our goal is to make certain uh, affected small businesses are able to apply for our loans um, throughout SBA. So let's spend a Thank moment, if, if I may, Secretary. Um, I think all the audience is very interested in the concept of eligibility and credit worthiness, right? So what happens? For people that have good scores, you know, significant cash flow in the past and they're strong, there's no doubt they're going to be able to be eligible, right? What happens if that score credit isn't as powerful, if the cash flow has not been as solid? Um, what happens with eligibility in those more difficult circumstances? Are they going to be denied or are they, what What would be the process? And, and I've just, you know, we heard something interesting what, from what you said of the declined, what happens with them 
but could you walk us through concepts of elig eligibility and credit worthiness, you or your team, so that people understand that and, and perhaps give them some hope that even if they're in that circumstance, right, encourage them to apply. So any, any thoughts and guidance would be highly appreciated. Thank you, Monica. That's a great question. And I have Michael from our Office of Disaster Assistance that could speak to that. But let me just reassure you that we have uh, resources to work through those very difficult situations. But more importantly, this administration is pursuant of bringing our small businesses and entrepreneurs not whole on day one, but definitely um, have enough resources, financial resources to address their workforce um, and get them back employed. That's really what we're focused in on um, to lessen the hardship. And Michael can cover the details that you just requested from our ODA office. Michael? Later. Michael? I'm un uh, muted. Can you please unmute him? Can, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. I hear you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Administrator. Uh, the three primary criteria for a small businesses to receive uh, one of these economic injury disaster loans, one and foremost is at the administrator uh, indicated earlier, uh, their credit history. You know, an applicant must have a credit history acceptable to the SBA. And I just want to point out that, you know, we don't necessarily look at it like a uh, financial institution or, or a banker look at it. We recognize that you as a business owner would have had an opportunity, would have been uh, affected by a disaster. So we're not going to look at it as stringent. Uh, the second is repayment ability. We're going to look at whether or not you have the ability to repay the loan. And the eligibility primarily is that you as the applicant must be in a declared county. And since we're declaring uh, states totally, uh, that shouldn't be an option. And again, you know, for the credit, uh, we're going to do everything within our power to make certain that that's not the reason for you to be declined. But we will look at those uh, loan applications on a case-by-case -case basis and, as I indicated, do everything within our power to make certain that you get through that process. But we will that's still cool. encourage all businesses, all small cool. businesses, to apply. Great. And how much is available? Walk us, please, through amounts, terms, interest rates. Great. Uh, all small businesses that apply, all small businesses that apply for this loan are eligible up to two million dollars. Uh, the interest rates are 3.75 percent for small businesses, 2.75 percent for private nonprofit organizations. Uh, we have the ability to extend these loans to make certain that people have the ability to to pay them and that it won't be a problem as they pay their other debt servicing. We can extend these loans out to 30 years. So we and want to make certain that they don't need to go through a financial institution. They can all do it online through the links that you'll provide and that are posted on your website, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. These the loans are directly from the Treasury. Uh, they can come directly to uh, the, the disaster center and complete the applications, and we'll work directly with them. Wonderful. And I understand they could be up to 30 years, right? The, the yes, up, up to 30 years. Wonderful. So um, what types of loans are available other than the economic injury disaster loans? Are there any other micro loans or expedited loans or lines of financing that what might be available? Or you're encouraging everyone to just go through the economic injury disaster loan application? For this particular loan, that's the only one that we have available that we can uh, ask them to go through. It's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and it is a working capital loan. It will not uh, do any repairs or anything like that because the virus is, is it's not a physical-type disaster. So this is only going to replace you know, those uh, funds that you missed in terms of making your payroll, uh, paying your regular and ordinary bills, 
uh, you know, and things of that nature. It's, it's not intent to do any repairs to any physical uh, apparatus associated. Right. Yes, and um, how long will it take to get approval, Michael? Well, right now, you know, if you get the, if the business get their application in, it's not going to take very long. Our standard for major disasters similar to this is usually between 14 and 21 days to get a decision. That's once we've received your application. However, if the applicant or the potential bar get that information in rather quickly, uh, it's probably going to take a little bit less than that right now. And um, tell us a little bit about regional offices. And I know that many in, in the call today have relationships and work with all of your regional offices. But could you share with us what will the role of the regional offices be in the virtual world we're living in in the weeks ahead? They will be available to provide you any type of assistance that you need in completing that application. If there is a need for the business to have some uh, assistance in completing their financial statements in order to uh, provide those documents to our loan processing center. Uh, the regional as well as the district offices will be available to that. They will be able to provide any business counseling that's necessary uh, that the business might need in order to process that, get that loan process uh, and things of that particular nature. They're, they're there as a fully resourced yeah. partner for the business owner. So, um, Michael, as you know, NMSDC has a network of regional offices and presidents and offices around the country. Um, would yeah. you suggest one of them to coordinate with their regional SBA offices in order to um, rally the resources and develop training and mentoring so that we, we can like sort of hold the hand, right, of the different business owners as they have a question, as they put together their packages? What recommendations would you share with us? I would say they would should contact their district director because we have a district director in every state. Uh, the region covers the regional office and, and obviously they will be available to assist you in whatever manner they can. But from a physical standpoint, there is a district office in every state. So I would say start initially with contacting that district office. But if they have a general question about the process, uh, we have a customer service center and I can give you that 800 number. You can easily call that number at any time and you can get one-on-one -on -one assistance with answering any question you have about that application process. Please share it, Michael. Thank you. Yes, that 800 number is 800-659-2955. 800-659-2955. Those offices are open from 7 in the morning to 9 in the evening, 7 days a week, and that's Eastern Standard Time. Thank you very much, Michael. We enormously appreciate all of the amount of work that you are doing. And I love that statement that you shared and that Secretary Carranza has shared that you are going to be there for the 30 million small business owners in this country. And so we're very grateful for that. We'll probably be in continued conversations as we explore how applicants are doing, if they're being denied, what pro problems do they find. So we look forward to continuing the conversation and we're very, very grateful for all the wonderful work that you have put together. God gave us this virus, but it also gave us internet and resources and hope, right? So I think that this all provides a tremendous amount of hopes for small business owners that are worried about meeting payroll, you know, their direct costs and making sure that they keep their businesses afloat while they redesign a longer term strategy. So thank you very much. We appreciate it. Any closing remarks, Mike, um, uh, with regard yes. to SP resources? Monica? Yes. Monica? Yes. This is the administrator. Oh, administrators. Thank you for joining us again. Yes, we're, we're listening to you, administrator. Yes, administ I mean, Monica, I want to cover a couple of points that Michael clarified, and that's exactly the procedure. You know, things change uh, by the hour, and so what we have um, agreed to do 
was to extend the or defer the payment of the disaster loans, which is normally six months, but we've extended that to a year. Fantastic. And I also. Yes, and I also have, um, and we've also done some uh, modifications in our when application process, or at least our assessment of the application, and have um, kind of lowered some thresholds so that we could expedite everything a, a lot quicker than what Michael indicated. I know that typically it's two to three weeks. We're trying to get down to a week. Um, and don't quote me because I'm sure my disaster assistance director will uh, come after me, but uh, we're, we're really pushing because what you said, Monica, we're blessed with this um, automation and quick recovery of uh, forms and, and um, uh, technology ac um, access. I do have, Monica, because I want to have your team, uh, uh, the audience, your participants, really have the benefit of also hearing about our other loan portfolio, which is the commercial, which they know very well, the express loan and the 7A. And we have Bill Briggs from our um, Office of Capital Access. Bill, are you there? If you can unmute him, he will add some, some uh, additional points about some of the very uh, impressive guarantees that we have and the banks that, we're poised, that we have poised to provide funds. So, Bill? Thank you, Administrator. You're welcome. Bill? So, we have you unmuted. I wonder if Bill, uh, who else we have? Um, Diana. Diana? Okay, no. Okay. Perhaps, the, because I know they were on a call with. Um, about 1,500 bankers, lenders, so I would not distract them from trying to take care of business on behalf of our small businesses. So um, I have an update as an administrator, and we'll be happy to um, share the information with everyone, but that's all great news. Yeah. Thank you very much. You were mentioning this morning in another town hall something that I think is very important for our audience as well, which is the additional packages of funds that are becoming available and in collaboration with Congress. Um, would you mind sharing with us a little bit of that as well for, for the uh, benefit of the audience? Yes, I know that there's um, several numbers that have been uh, quoted, such as 50 billion, 240 billion, 300 billion. What I can assure you is that a portion of the 300 billion will be designated for small businesses mm -hmm. and um, whether it's a self -propri proprietor or it's the underbanked uh, unbanked or for that matter um, um, there's no it's it's no limited whether it's a small or medium-sized business so we're looking at the NICS codes as well but bottom line a large portion of those funds are going to be made available to small businesses. We're currently working with the world's largest uh, lending institutions so that we can facilitate those funds immediately. We'd like to make an announcement as early as Friday tomorrow, uh, if not as early as Monday, on how um, we have established. Because as you know, we have a particular infrastructure we also have a need out in the community, and we also have relationships with institutions that could provide, could process, could disperse the funds much quicker, in some cases than SBA, even if we, even if we partner with Treasury or Social Security. So we're looking at the most efficient and expedient manner in dispersing these funds that are going to be made available now. Although those funds will be available, as you know, legislation needs to take place. So that's another one week to two weeks, and that's why we're um, asking our lenders to provide funds. We have $18 billion available already. It's, it's not even the package that we're talking about um, currently. It's about appropriated funds that were already um, authorized 
so that banks could provide funds, and we have $18 billion at SBA that would guarantee those funds that the banks would provide our small businesses. In the disaster assistance, we have about $7 billion available. Now, SBA provides that funding. We process through the IRS. That's why we have to conservatively tell you that it takes a few more days to process. But at least the small businesses could anticipate those funds under the disaster and idle loan. The other, these um, 7A and 504 and express uh, loans are definitely dispersed by the banks, but we guarantee those funds, So it, and that's to motivate them to provide those funds to small businesses. Um, so you. any more details we'll make available to you, Monica. But again, I would look out for an announcement on Friday or Monday. Ma Madam it. Administrator, this is Bill Briggs. I'm sorry for the difficulties. We are here with Diana Seaborn, um, and we just echo what you say, the quickest way to get money out to folks right now is to work with our SBA lenders. We have a, a lot of authority right now to do so. We encourage them to get a qualified SBA loan, not an emergency loan, to go to sba.gov slash lender match and put in your financing you're looking for and lenders have signed up and they're ready to take those and those requests go nationwide. And they all operate, they're all SBA approved lenders, so they operate under our standards for interest rates and terms, which are reasonable. reasonable. So sba.gov slash lender match right now to find regular lenders and non-disaster lending, uh, non-disaster funds uh, right now. So I just want to echo that. Thank you, Madam Administrator. Thank you. And if I missed a point, make sure you cover it. <laughs> I'm going to interrupt you one second. I just want to thank the administrator for sharing her time with us today. Um, we really appreciate it. This is Adrian Trimble, President and CEO of the National Minority Supplier Development Council, um, where our constituents of our affiliate presidents, certified minority businesses, and our corporate members, thank you for your time and the information. We will certainly work with your team to get consolidated information that we can share with our constituents um, so that we have a resource available for them so they can follow up after this call. So we just want to thank you for your time and your attention and, and, and take the time to share directly with our audience today. Adrian, what, Adrian, what you can do for us here at SBA is to um, amplify, be our echo chamber, that we are open for business, that we are doing everything humanly possible to expedite any of the current programs that have been authorized, and we're working very closely with Treasury, the National uh, Economic Council at the White House, as well as OMB, to come up with other more aggressive solutions to helping small businesses and households. Absolutely. Thank you for that, and we will definitely be working with you and your team. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate Thank you, Monica. Uh, Great, great leader presence. Thank you very much. So now we are going to um, uh, make another introduction of, uh, of a wonderful panelist, Mr. Ashley Daniel Bell. Uh, Mr. Bell is currently the White House Policy Advisor on Entrepreneurship and Innovation with the White House Office of American Innovation. Uh, his role is um, promoting federal resources available to American entrepreneurs as well as to support the opportunity for small business growth through America's supply chains. Uh, so in addition, uh, Mr. Ashley uh, is, was appointed in February of 2018 as the regional administrator of the US Small Business Administration for region four. So he covers, he serves nine districts located in eight southeastern, southeastern states of Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. The regional administrator Bell has oversight of around $5 billion in SBA back lending and the counseling arm of the SBA, which counseled over 225,000 entrepreneurs last year in the region four and the contracting programs for small businesses, which account for over 23% of all federal contracts awarded. So Ashley, thank you very much for joining us today. And now I will open it up to you to give us updates from the White House of what is going on and very especially with regard to support 
and diverse businesses. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I think you have a great team. I want to thank uh, Madam President and CEO for inviting me and uh, Dr. Mesler and the team uh, for having me. You know, this is a great opportunity to continue the discussion with uh, our small businesses. And I think in particular, the next couple of weeks are going to be important. And I think some of the information that you received, uh, especially from our disaster, uh, uh, friends at SBA disaster assistance is critical. Uh, as we know that most minority owned businesses only have about two weeks of working capital. So when you have a situation where you could go from uh, whatever revenues you have to zero, uh, that is important that we are able to disperse resources quickly to be able to uh, stem the effects of this, uh, of this pandemic and hopefully uh, able to put long-term resources in place as Congress and the president uh, work to find a long-term viable solution uh, to help us through these economic times. Uh, yeah, I think it's critical. I want to touch a little bit more on some of the things that you heard about. Um, what's also different about SBA's uh, program when it comes to uh, uh, emergency assistance is that uh, in this special uh, time, we also will allow uh, loans to nonprofits. And that's something that you normally don't see. But you know that nonprofits are so critical so many times in our communities. So if you're the chair of a, of a Boys and Girls Club or you have a nonprofit uh, that focuses on working with small businesses and that nonprofit is also seeing the effects of this virus, then how important is it for us to make sure that our friends uh, in nonprofits like, uh, like many of the trade associations that we all know and love also are able to receive this assistance and they're able to do so at a discounted uh, interest rate. So that interest rate is actually one point lower than the 3.75 that was mentioned earlier. It's actually 2.75 for uh, nonprofits. So I think it's critical that we we understand that as Administrator Carranza mentioned, all 50 states will be declared very soon. And, and, and because these two weeks are so critical, we need your help to let uh, these businesses that, that we serve in underserved communities understand that this resources are available now, that they can apply now, because there are detrimental effects if we don't uh, let them know that this resource is there. So I look forward to just answering more questions from, uh, from your group. And I think if you go uh, to sba.gov um, and, and some of our other resource partners from the labor department and other places have many more resources that are coming down uh, from the various stimulus packages to support small businesses. Yes, wonderful. So thank you very much. We appreciate your presence today and all the work that you are doing to support small and diverse business owners. And um, with that, I'm going to pass it on to, we have two more panelists joining us today that are going to provide us a perspective, two important perspectives. One, the perspective of the role of corporate America and the role of innovation. And what are we doing? You know, when there's challenge, there's also opportunity. And uh, we're also going to talk about specific tools that organizations like the one I run, the one Rafael runs, many um, asset management, investment management, banking associations, banks can provide to be able to, to have specific tools. I personally believe that the best and only tool that every business owner should think about if they have a liquidity issue, nothing will be the SBA um, source of, of lending with the economic injury disaster loan. So I think that that is a line of first resource, the first 30, 60 days. It's, and we appreciate immensely all the work you're doing. But I'm going to now um, pass it on to Mr. Alfred Edmond. Alfred is the senior VP and executive editor at large of Black Enterprise. Uh, he's responsible for providing brand marketing and content leadership as a member of a multimedia company senior management team. And prior to his position, Edmund was the senior VP and chief content officer responsible for overseeing all of the media platforms of Black Enterprise across events, video, digital, digital websites, social media, print, and other content distribution properties. So from 2008 to 2010, Edmund was senior VP editor in chief of Black Enterprise helping to lead the transition from single magazine publisher to digital first media. Um, so a wealth of, of knowledge, Alfred, and we appreciate immensely your presence with us today. And as we were preparing yesterday for um, this, this town hall, um, all of us thought about the very important role of corporate America, right? We are in partnership with them. Um, I would say every NMSDC member is um, a, a minority certified company that is serving a corporation, serving government. 
And so uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts and um, your sentiment of, you know, how, how do we do this together, right? What is the role of collaboration and, and intentional and purposeful collaboration between our suppliers and corporate America so that we can walk these difficult times together, right? And, and of course there's challenges at every level, but give us your perspective of what, what, what is the role of corporate America and how should we continue to partner with such an important partner to ensure you know, um, that our business owners continue to thrive and the economy continues to thrive. And knowing that we're all in exceptional times, right? We're all in a boat that is in a, in a challenging time, but uh, there's, there's, there will be tomorrow, there will be an after the crisis, and I think that's where we all want to put our minds into, right? How do we prepare? What do we do today so that after the crisis, we have viable business owners that are still thriving? Well, thank you, Monica. Thank you for that, that great introduction. Uh, thank you to uh, the NMSDC for um, partnering with Black Enterprise and others to even give the idea of putting this on today, because uh, I think it's very important that we don't wait to start thinking about what we can do now, but also what we're gonna to need to do over the long haul because business has changed forever. Let's, let's understand that. Um, once we get past this crisis, um, for better or for worse, I happen to think so a lot of it's gonna be for the better, we're gonna to have to do business differently um, in order to move forward as a country, as an economy. Um, so I, I wanna focus on just you know two things as, as we talked about um, in our prep call yesterday. One, and I know we have a lot of MS, um, NMSDC corporate members on the call. Uh, these are the major corporations that, that America is, 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 relies on to help drive the larger economy to compete globally. And so understandably, we, we are seeing as we're watching the news channels over the last couple of days, you know, the, the relief that's being proposed, whether it's for the airline industry, the hotel industry, and the other major industries that we know are, are gonna you know, drive um, our economic engine. But what is important for us to remember that small business um, in general and small diverse businesses in particular have to thrive in order for major corporations to thrive. And, and we're encouraged, um, blackenterprise.com has been reporting even over the last couple of days, companies like Facebook that has earmarked $100 million to help small businesses. JP Morgan Chase has earmarked already $50 million to help small businesses. That's a beginning, but it's a very, very strong, um, small beginning. It's very important that major corporations, multinationals and nationals um, who, who need this relief because the release is designed to not just help the bottom lines and the shareholder interests of those corporations, but the idea is to, for that um, help, that stimulus to work its way down through smaller suppliers, first, second, and third tier suppliers, their employees, the communities that are served by both the corporations and those suppliers that create jobs, to create economic activity. So, you know, my, my message to corporate America is that supplier diversity and diversity in general and inclusion um, with regard to surviving this crisis and thriving beyond it needs to be a front end conversation, not a back end conversation, not a wait till later conversation and not a side conversation. Um, if, if these communities aren't thriving, if these smaller businesses aren't thriving, then the large corporations in the long run can't really be as um, profitable and shareholders can't be served the way we know we want them to be served. So this is, this is one where we are literally all in the same boat, whether we're a one or two person business operation in Chicago, or we're a multinational corporation with assets on, on the ground in multiple countries. The second thing I wanna say, and this to all of us, small business owners, as well as large corporations, but I think small business owners really um, need to really try to keep this in mind. We cannot let the urgent um, stop us from dealing with the important. Here's what I mean. We are in a crisis situation. We are dealing with an urgent situation in terms of just trying to stay healthy, to protect our hospital systems and to survive and thrive. So, so of course we have to deal with what we have to deal with. But we also have to remember that we have to have a business that thrives, an economy that thrives after we get past this, we will get past this. So it's important for us to look at, look now at how we can change the way we do business now to be, take advantage of opportunities and the new reality that will emerge from this as we go forward. Um, and two, two particular areas is, is uh, tele, teleworking. What we're doing now because we have no choice we need to think about how do we retrofit our businesses to take advantage of that going forward. 
for, and, and, and not do it just because it's an emergency, but it's a great way to do business. We need to perfect that. Um, the second thing is the whole idea of hygiene and disease prevention as a customer service, as a uh, security measure, and as a technological measure um, that says, we're not gonna wait until the next crisis to think about what can we do to teach our employees to create policies and procedures and opportunities so that the next virus or the next one after that, we are better prepared economically as well as just from the, you know, just the personal well being of us as human beings on this planet are prepared to deal with that. And that's a small business solution. Um, it's not just a large company's problem, it's a small business problem, and we need to be prepared to address it. Right. And needless to say, the pay on time or pay earlier, right, should definitely be fantastic resources that business owners would be mm -hmm. immensely grateful with corporations and see if they just you know, kept payments, right? Um, you wanna share a little bit of thought on that, on that regard? Yeah, I mean, with the corp large corporations have to be mindful. And, I, and I, I, I know because JP Morgan Chase is a partner of Black Enterprise, I know they are, um, of the fact that as difficult as it might be for, let's call it a large airline, you have resources and margins of error that do not exist. As Ashley Bell said, you know, the margin of error for the average small business is weeks, sometimes it's days. So, you know, we don't have the same cushion around, you know, waiting for 35, 45, 90 days of payment that is, that is common, of course, along, among major corporations. So yes, um, this is a crisis situation and the ability to, you know, push those payments forward, to credit those payments, to do other things that you can do to keep those small businesses viable in the short run you know, that, could, that you can recoup that in the long run because those businesses will be thriving and provide the services that the corporations need in the long run and their customers need in the long run. Um, and I love what Secretary Carranza just shared with us that at the government level, they're going to be putting out programs to protect the government suppliers to make sure they keep running. And I think that would be a formula that, you know, we would probably invite and um, just uh, suggest corporations and small business owners to think about ways in which they can continue to collaborate. What are ways in which corporations can, you know, just keep the, keep the ball going because at some point the crisis will finish and business, it might've been changed forever, but it will continue. And so it is a, a time to communicate, to hold hands, to strategize together instead of just cutting them off, right? Because cutting them off can have devastating consequences and they won't be able to meet their payroll. They won't be able to meet their vendors. And you have like this supply chain completely halted. So, um, and, and I know it's a challenging uh, situation for everyone, right? Small, mid and small and large businesses, everyone is in, in the crisis, but thank mm -hmm. you for sharing those, those um, thoughts. Alfred, let's switch to innovation, opportunity, right? As, as they say, never, never let, let a crisis go wasted, right? And so in, in times of challenge, there's also time of opportunity. You know, I'm a private equity investor. I see that valuations are gonna go down. And as I say, entrepreneurs, good entrepreneurs are not gonna leave. We, we can wanna continue to back them, wanna continue to work with them. There will be industries, there will be opportunities that will be available that weren't before or that are going to be very well priced to be able to take advantage of them. And, and so, you know, investors like us are just tuning into that now. And, and when we have capital availability, I think there's, there's going to be an ability to back entrepreneurs. Tell us about that, how you see innovation and opportunity in light of a challenging environment for all today, for sure. Now, sort of the doors are closed now, but at some time they will open. And, and what, what does innovation and opportunity uh, mean for you? What, what are you seeing? Well, that, that's what I mean when I say don't let the urgent get in the way of the important. It's important, even in this crisis um, environment, especially many of us are working from home and we have some time to think whether we want it or not, um, right. to think about how does this change our lives? How does this change our businesses? And how can I really be of service once we emerge from this? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the tragedy would be for us to survive the health crisis but be ill positioned for the economic crisis that could follow. Uh, and so it's important to think about, um, you know, I, I think about the, the crisis after 9-11 and how the travel industry has totally reinvented itself and small businesses are a big part of that. Everything from the time it takes you to get from the gate, from, excuse me, from the, um, from the check-in at the counter to the gate at the airport 
has been totally retrofitted over the last um, 15 to 20 years because of the innovations that came out of the tragedy and the, and, the, and the life change, the shock to the way we lived our lives coming out of that tragedy. So I don't know what all the innovations are. I do know that, um, that we're, we're learning lessons right now about what services and support are gonna be needed for a working population um, that may do more, much more of his business the way we're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. um, what could you be providing as a small business owner to facilitate that that's of value to the marketplace that, that's worth paying for, that corporations would pay for and individuals would pay for. But the thing is you need to be thinking about that now using your current experiences, tapping into the intelligence in your own company, the people that work for you, what are their ideas? Um, the part, the companies, your part, the corporations you're partnering with, how could you be a better service to them? This shouldn't be just about what can an NMSDC corporate partner do for you as a small business. This is the time to say to them, what could we be doing as a vendor, as a supplier for you to, to, to facilitate what you're trying to do? Because that only strengthens your relationship and your marketability as a small business in the long haul as we emerge from the health crisis and then try to really survive and thrive beyond the economic implications that are gonna have some lasting effects beyond the, beyond the health crisis. The health crisis may be, hopefully will, will be, I mean, we're, I'm being optimistic, let's say it's less than a year, the economic implications may go for years beyond that, but it's gonna take innovation and innovative thinking now, think about what can we do to position ourselves to take advantage of opportunities and, and, and recover as quickly as possible. Right, right. Thank you, Alfred. So very much appreciate your thoughts. And now we're going to turn to the money that has always been available, right? Or, you know, challenging to get at times, but uh, passing from disaster recovery to tools that have been in the market. Um, you know, in, in my case, I represent, and I'm the co-founder of a private equity fund, private equity and private debt fund. And so as you can all imagine, we have a portfolio of companies that are now going together with us the, through this crisis. What we've done with them is we've created a navigation and response matrix that covers all the key areas of business. Mm -hmm. And we're asking them to think about liquidity as the most important criteria. If you can't survive the crisis, then you're gonna go under, right? So the most important thing is to survive the crisis and to have liquidity at hand and think about 30, 60, 90 days ahead. And the matrix includes things like, you know, workforce first and foremost, right? How is your workforce um, weathering this situation? Uh, both the empl permanent employees and temporary revenue considerations, operation considerations, supply chain considerations, insurance continuity, contingency plans. How do you need to change them? Liquidity, again, that is king to pay personnel, to pay operating costs, to cover supply chain costs, to service debt. Then virtual transitions, right? Every business has had to figure out how to be virtual. Uh, stakeholders communications, we're emphasizing this significantly make sure that you are effectively communicating with your employees, with your clients, with your suppliers, uh, so that you have a plan together. And also be very close with your local organizations that might have resources um, that, that may be valuable. And we're also saying, you know, think about opportunity. A very important part of this plan is think about opportunity. Um, so with, with that in mind, I want to pass it on to Rafael Martinez. Rafael is somebody who is in the market every day supporting uh, small business owners. Rafael is the CEO of MBE Capital Partners, which was established with the strategic objective of developing straightforward financing products for small and mid-sized businesses. And so Rafael, tell us about what you're seeing in the market and what are recommendations that you have today for business owners that are going through the, the situations we know everyone is going through, right? Trying to reassess the next 30, 60, 90 days and then moving forward. So, Rafael. Perfect, thank you, Monica. And thank you, Adrian, and the rest of the NMSDC family. Um, so what's really funny is that, you know, we've been, this September will be 21 years old and um, it's not changed, it's just, it just it's the same problem, but magnified. So what we've been looking at, it's really two things for these vendors, cash flow, one and the same. You know, at the end of the day, you have to keep cash coming through the uh, bank account. 
what you're not going to see are the effects of the corporations paying you a little bit longer because now they have to hold on to cash a little bit longer and you're being asked to finance a trillion dollar company. So over the years, we've only looked at how we can grow and scale these women minority owned companies. And the basic, the basic program that we do is really a, what we call supply chain finance light. Um, most of these supply chain finance programs in these Fortune 500 companies really only cater to the top three to five percentile of the vendor pool. What we're looking at is managing the tail. So we created something called ASP, Accelerated Supplier Pay. And through that, we're completing the acquisition of supplier success and working with Lewis Green to really develop a FinTech that will allow vendors to support growth and scale in our community. You know, one of the things that we really want to drive at this moment is maintaining jobs. Our normal scope of business is helping create jobs, but at this moment, we want to create jobs from the standpoint of keeping jobs. So as long as we don't have attrition and subtraction of jobs, I think we're going to be doing our job in a more meaningful way. Um, I don't know that there's any difference at this point in time with regards to the marketplace. I think it's just times a million. And for those individuals that are prepared, um, they will have the opportunity to get through this uh, moment in time, but also come out with other opportunities. Because what you don't see behind the scenes are some suppliers and some vendors will not exist anymore, and somebody's going to have to pick up a slide. And that's what we're really here to do. So within the platform on supplier success, we're going to have the ability for you to go on and apply for loans. Um, and, and our entire process is really how do we bring lower cost of capital to the market? Over the years, you know, everything under the sun and now the latest and greatest is the merchant cash advance loans, which come with interest rates north of 50%. What we're trying to do is create that same type of model, but something at 9.9%. So giving you money within a three day period, but not taking your firstborn or, you know, me taking the money for your kids um, college fund uh, just so that you can keep the lights on for another day. So the, the whole aspect of what we try to do here at MBE Capital, and now um, once we get on board with uh, supplier success is making cash flow the number one thing. You know, how do you, instead of, everybody talks about access to capital, access to capital. What we're talking about is access to cash flow. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have money to pay payroll every week or every two weeks, monthly overhead, and you know, paying your suppliers on time, how do you move forward? How do you become a more viable vendor to your corporate partner? Right, right. And you you remind me of uh, a conversation we've had for decades on the access to capital, that it's access to capital, it's access to cash. But very importantly, it's management and control of capital, because as being architects of our own solutions, having our own banks, our own CDFIs, our own institutions that can be readily available to work with our business owners, in my estimation, that architecture is like paramount to be able to really develop a system that is supportive of our own business owners. Like the world I live in of private equity, the majority of private equity funds are not diverse, you know, hopefully that'll change as the years go by, but, you know, people invest in the people they know. And so I think that it is important that we continue to collaborate. Um, I love the initiatives like the one that we did with the billion dollar round table where we created the triad initiative to align the interests of small and diverse entrepreneurs with the corporate needs of goods and services and bring the right capital partners to be able to finance and I know, you know, the, there's such variety of business owners in the call today, right? There's people that have, you know, two hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue. There's probably companies that are past a billion or two billion in revenue. So there, there's definitely such a, a wide variety of sizes of businesses, cycles of where they're in, a year born, twenty years uh, born, uh, and industries, right? And we have different segments and regions. And so I think that as uh, we move forward in this endeavor of supporting small businesses, 
we have to continue to zoom in them, right? And understand what are the type of solutions that they need short-term, long-term. And I think about, for example, Rafa, you, you, you satisfy a short-term cash flow need. Like we don't do anything of, of less than a year. We're, we're thinking long-term. What's the next manufacturing facility? What are you going to acquire? Do you need a transition strategy? And our sizes of checks are a million or more. It's the, the smallest size of check is a million. What is your smallest size of check, Rafael? That's a great question. I will. I want to step back for a second. You said something very important. We kind of do business with people we know. So last year we did $1.7 billion in financing in this space. And over 85% of that was uh, done with uh, women minority owned companies. 83% of it done with minority owned companies. Um, that's who I know. That's who we work with. And over the 21 years, it's been a 100% focus on minority firms. Um, yes, you're so right. 68% of our portfolio business owners and, and CEOs, they're, they're minorities, business diverse in any way, but, you know, but yes, I, and, and I think that's a, a great example. If yeah, so I with regards to, to the, the dollar figure. I will, we'll open for questions. So yes, I, I was going to say, I was going to say the dollar you, figure, we have clients as low as 500,000 and as large as um, about 25 million. Our largest client will do over $400 million this year. And the smallest check you, is 500,000, I heard? Yeah, it, we, we work in revenues per year. So we work with, the, the number one thing that we look at is your ability to grow. So if you're a lifestyles business where you're going at a million dollars this year, a million one next year, 900,000 a year after that, it's really, we'll help you out, but that's not our sweet spot. Our sweet spot a typical client's coming to us with about seven to $10 million in sales. Next year, they're doing 15, 16. The year after that, they're up 25, 30. We have something that's called our power program, where it's power 10, 25, 50, and 100. And we help companies that are doing two or $3 million get to $10 million. Those doing $10 million get to the 25, 50, and $100 million per year. Really, Thank you. The individuals that are coming to us don't have a problem doing business. They just have a problem financing the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And in, on, on our end, like that threshold is companies that at least have 1 million in EBITDA, but it could be, for example, a target acquisition, right? And, and it, 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 as long as it has at least a million in EBITDA, it could be 2 million in revenue, as long as it has a million in EBITDA. Um, so we're going to um, open it up for questions. Um, and so let's see, uh, there, there was a very interesting question uh, about will, and, and this is probably for you, Adrian, and the NMSDC team, is there a vendor list that you could um, spread out by industry, by region saying, here are the capable and able minority companies by industry, by region that can work uh, and, and sort of promote them right so because if somebody needs a technology company somebody needs an accounting for whatever is 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 there a way to promote these business owners so that the market knows about them yes monica actually we're working with our corporations our corporate members to understand specifically what they're looking for by industry uh, nmsdc has over i believe 12 industry groups that we work with uh, pretty consistently, and actually it's become even more important during this time, we've had an uptick of requests coming in from our industry uh, group uh, members looking for specific MBEs in the spaces that they have a strong need. So any corporate member can get that information from us as well. So we do segment our information by industry and try to promote those MBEs in those spaces. And so when you identify an opportunity because a corporation says, I need this, how does the NMSDC go about, is it through the regional offices that then the companies are contacted or what, what is the process to be able to make sure that, that that business owner knows about it and that they can participate in, in the bid or opportunity? So it can happen two ways. So uh, our corporate members let NMSDC or our regional councils know when there are opportunities that they're sourcing for MBEs. And, but we strongly encourage our MBEs to stay very connected to their affiliate councils because that's where a lot of the work is happening is at, on the field level. The affiliate councils are the delivery arm for NMSDC. So we are making sure we have strong communication between whatever we know that's going on at the national office. When we hear from our corporate members, we're gonna shoot that out to our, our affiliate councils to help them 
find MBEs that we may not know directly because Raphael made a really good point. We wanna know who those MBEs are that are tried, true and tested and we know that they've been vetted and that they can deliver the service. So um, we definitely work very closely with our councils to do that. Wonderful. Yes, thank you, Adrian. Someone is asking if it's possible, and I don't know the answer, so I'm going to read it. Is it possible to obtain a copy of this recording? There are a couple of people that may be able to assist, uh, and and there's there's um, a request if if the recording will be available. I'm sorry. Yes, the recording will be available after this session. It will be posted on our website um, so that people who were not uh, able to join and those who may want to go back and listen to it will will have the link up uh, this evening sometime wonderful it is being recorded. yes thank you adrian so i'm looking at the box of q a uh let's see if there are any that we did not answer so monica there's one that i see that i would like to pose out to the group i'm going to start first with uh ashley and then others can jump in there's a group from gina day a question from that says, what resources do we have for micro businesses? Those businesses with, with revenue less than 250,000 per year and employees of 10 or less. Um, they're looking for guidance and support. And as we know, with um, the challenges that we're having right now, that could be a very uh, left out marketplace if we don't understand how to support the smaller businesses. So Ashley, if you could start first and then I'll open it up to the others on the panel. Oh, is Ashley still here? There we go. You can hear me now. There you go. Um, there we go. Okay. All right. So the loan products that we talked about, uh, those that criteria and that market is very much included. I think that when you look at those businesses, uh, the dividing line for the emergency loan for the SBA disaster is about $25,000. So if you're asking for a, a loan of less than $25,000, then no collateral is required. Those are signature loans from SBA. And remember, these are loans that are coming directly from SBA, not through a commercial bank. These are direct SBA loans. Over $25,000 to $100,000, uh, they're, they're very flexible about what type of collateral is, is available, meaning that you could use personal uh, assets or business assets in order to reach that goal. Uh, but most importantly, actually, that is the, the target audience. So we want you to make sure that if you want to apply for those loans, you can do it online at sba.gov. Uh, forward slash disaster and, and that's a very critical segment of our population we want to make sure understands that this loan was really created for them and a follow-up to that question with regard to grants uh will there be any grants offered for small businesses and i've heard there's been legislative conversations about this can can you share with us what is the latest with regard to potential grants even for like the, the next 30 days right urgent grants well the, the the only grants that are uh primarily coming out that affect small businesses are through the department of labor uh, and i think you can see some workforce grants uh and some tax credits there uh, so i would look at the department of labor's website and see if your business applies but there are some grants to the department of labor when it comes to workforce and incentives to help people uh, maintain their workforce during this time Mm -hmm. okay. Just, uh, Adrian and Monica, if, if I could jump in. Go right ahead. So th this is where I, I was talking about the importance of whether it's government entities, large corporations and other entities really zeroing in on these kind of really tiny micro businesses that are important to our economy. But as the point has been made over the last couple of days in the news cycle, it's relatively easy to find large corporations to target relief to. And it's relatively easy to target relief to individuals, you know, families and individuals, because obviously between the IRS and our social security numbers, we're, we're findable. The harder group to connect relief to um, is that, that kind of micro business that's operational, very, very small. They're not going to do business with IBM. They're not going to do business with Xerox, but yet they are still critical to the health of communities and the economy, and they have families to support, et cetera. So the more that we can do um, um, as individuals and as institutions to connect the resources that Ashley's talking about, whether it's through the Labor Department or other departments, to these businesses, the more effective we want to be coming out of this in terms of the long-term economic recovery of the nation. And, and so corporations, nonprofits, government entities, we have the resources, but we have to really engage our relationships to make sure that that small micro business that just needs you know ten thousand dollars worth of relief understands where to go to get that before they run out of the, um, time 
and running out of time could be a matter of a couple of weeks and, and they, can, they could be out of business. So Monica, we're right at uh, 15 after the hour. So we're going to be respectful of all of our attendees, our, our time and our panelists' time. Thank you, Monica, so much for moderating this session for us. Thank you to all the panelists for your participation. We knew that this was going to be a very engaging uh, discussion because it's top of mind for a lot of our, our attendees and those on the, on, the, on the webcast. So thank you. What we're going to do is make sure that we get all the questions that were captured that we couldn't get to today. We're going to take those and go back and get those answered and post those along with the live link to this so that we can make sure we're keeping our constituents updated and getting them the information that they need. So hopefully we'll have the link itself posted within the hour. Thank you all so much for your participation and there will be more of these to come. We know that now that with um, the social distancing put in place, we want to make sure that we don't lose the ability to get information out. So stay tuned, take a look at our, our social media and our website to make sure that you know when our next webinar series will take place. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Have Thanks again very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. All bye the bye. Bye bye. Be well and be safe.